page handout for this presentation, and it can be found on my web page under Web Lectures. This is the third lecture in the series. In order to best understand this presentation, I would recommend that you listen to the first lecture entitled Beyond the Evolution versus Creation Debate. And I will also ask you to print out handout B because I will be using it in this presentation. The Beyond lecture will give you some background information so that you can fully appreciate my personal story and in particular my struggle in coming to terms with evolution and indeed I struggled a lot with this topic over a 20-year period. Well, I, uh, I did say this was a personal story, and it doesn't get any more personal than being in the buff. I was born in Canada, in Edmonton, Alberta. I was raised in a good French-Canadian Roman Catholic home. We weren't wealthy, but there was a lot of love, and there was discipline, and what more can you ask for? My mother's a very devout Christian, and she's been instrumental in leading many in the family to faith. From grade 7 to 12, I attended Collège Saint-Jean, a French-Canadian Roman Catholic boys' school. Academically, it was an excellent school, and athletically, we were well known for our championship hockey teams. In high school, I was introduced to the idea of evolution. My biology teacher, who was a very devout Christian man, told us that evolution did not have to conflict with our faith. And that's all he said on the topic. But now that I'm an instructor at a university, I realize that simply telling a student some fact is not enough. Students need an explanation. They need to be given reasons in order to accept an idea. So telling a student simply that evolution does not have to conflict with our faith leaves them vulnerable, in particular. It leaves them vulnerable to the common misconceptions in our culture. Whether we are aware of it or not, our culture impacts us powerfully and forces upon us many ideas that become part of our worldview. With regards to the origin of the universe and life, there are two very powerful cultural misconceptions that imprison our minds and that limit our ability to think freely. Cultural misconception number one is the origins dichotomy. As you will note on the first page of your handout, a dichotomy is the division of an issue into two simple positions, and it is caused by either-or type thinking, or to put it another way, it is the result of black and white thinking. In our culture, many people assume there are only two positions on origins. One is either an evolutionist or a creationist. One is either scientific or religious, and as a result, if you accept evolution and science, there's no place for God. Regrettably, many people are trapped in this dichotomy, and it is a big part of my personal story. As you will see, I was entrenched in this black and white approach to origins for many years. But of course, I must now ask the question. Are there only two positions on origins, evolution or creation, or are there credible positions in between? Cultural misconception number two is scientific concordism. This is the assumption that the Bible reveals scientific facts, in particular scientific facts on how the world was created. In other words, many believe that the Bible aligns or accords, and this is where we get the word concordism, that the Bible accords with the discoveries of modern science. Now, the idea of scientific concordism is very reasonable. Think about it. God is the creator of the world, and God is the author of the Bible. It's perfectly logical to assume that the facts of nature are in accord with the statements about nature in the Bible. Most people in our culture, both religious and non-religious, assume this is the case. 
of course, I must now ask the question, but is it true? Is scientific concordism a feature of the Bible? And if it isn't a feature of the Bible, does it mean that we have to reject the Bible? You will soon see how this second cultural misconception dramatically impacted my life. My first year of college was at Collège Universitaire Saint-Jean, which was the French faculty at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. My first biology course was entirely on evolution. I remember the professor beginning the class with the standard statement, evolution does not have to conflict with religious faith. But again, not explaining to students why this is the case had no impact on us whatsoever. Towards the end of that first term of college, my parents became aware that I was no longer going to church. We sat down and I explained to them that evolution was a fact, and since the Bible stated the world was created in six days, the Bible had to be false. Needless to say, my parents were quite distressed. But please note, the two cultural misconceptions controlled my mind. I was trapped in the origins dichotomy and I assumed that scientific concordism was a feature of the Bible. Given these assumptions, I, like many others in my culture, reasoned that since evolution was true, it was impossible to be a Christian. Now, the question must be asked, did I completely reject the existence of God and become an atheist at this time? And the answer can be found in my diary at the end of my first year of college. I write, it seems that whenever one does something, it can be explained by examining the individual's background. The more I study this, the more it seems that man is but a mere chemical reaction programmed by DNA. This looks pretty bleak and atheistic, but then at the bottom of the page I add, but there's more I'm sure. In other words, humans had to be something more than just molecules put together by blind chance. But there's one thing that is certain in this diary entry. I was certainly on the path heading towards atheism. Let's use the chart of the different positions on origins from my first web lecture entitled Beyond the Evolution versus Creation Debate. This is handout B. In 1973, I would roughly class myself as a deist. Deism is the belief that there is some sort of God, but it's a very impersonal God. This is definitely not the God of religion. Such a God leaves you to live your life any way you want. There are no demands like those expected of the God of religion. Now, I must confess that I was a pretty inconsistent deist. I wanted nothing to do with God, except, of course, when I was in trouble. For example, when I thought my girlfriend was pregnant. I used to pray up a storm. Oh, God, don't let her be pregnant. Don't let her be pregnant. In other words, God was this magical servant boy who I needed when I messed up. I went on to dental school and I also joined the armed forces. The military paid for my education. It was in dental school that I met evangelical Christians for the first time in my life. Though I had no use for religion whatsoever, I was certainly impressed with their consistent lifestyle. Looking back now years later, I knew that they had something special. And somewhere in my soul, I wanted it too. But then, I didn't want to change my lifestyle. I loved to swear like a sailor. I loved getting drunk out of my mind and smoking drugs. Yes, I inhaled. And I was living with my girlfriend. Religion was not going to mess with my life. I wanted to be the captain on my ship. 